morning, good, uh, good afternoon, good morning if there is someone from US to uh, participating in this session of the uh, CAL conference dedicated in particular to the topic of the investments. Um, this is not a good time as all we know, but I hope that the topics discussed in the conference and in particular in this session will be of interest to the participants. And uh, I hope that will make us forget for a moment uh, this distance we are forced to face. Um, I give you some details uh, about the schedule that we will follow. Uh, we have uh, four presentations, uh, each one lasting 20 minutes in the program. And uh, at the end, there will be room about 20 or 25 minutes for questions uh, from uh, the attendee. Um, I remind you at uh, 6 o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, immediately after this uh, parallel session uh, will be a panel session dedicated to regulatory issues uh, uh, moderated by Antonella Sharone of uh, Uni Università Cattolica. The main topic there will be the recent proposal of the European Commission related, uh, uh, released recently uh, on September 24, uh, that uh, includes a comprehensive new regulation proposal on crypto assets called uh, Markets in Crypto Asset, MICA. Uh, I invite you to participate because the topic is relevant and it is likely to influence the future development of the crypto market activities uh, in Europe. Okay. Um, if you agree, uh, I start with the schedule. Uh, the first paper that uh, will be presented by Lennart Ante of Hamburg University. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, Monetary Flows and Feedback Trading Cryptocurrency Markets, Effects of Stablecoin Transfers on return and trading volume of Bitcoin. Uh, in this work, they, through the possibility of mapping flows on the blockchain, a unique feature of this market, the authors uh, give, uh, shed light on the, the connection between stable coins and cryptocurrencies, in particular in case of flows uh, of a relevant amount. Um, I thank you, Leonard, and uh, I leave the word to you uh, to present uh, uh, your research paper. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm gonna share my presentation real quick. Are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, then perfect. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, um, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Leonard Ante. I'm a, a research associate at the Blockchain Research Lab in Hamburg, and I'm also pursuing a PhD at Hamburg University. And today I'm going to present uh, the work as was just introduced on stablecoins and Bitcoin. And um, yeah, I want to emphasize this is a work in progress. We published a working paper, but uh, this working paper deserves the name working paper. So uh, yeah, work in progress. So, um, okay, my slides. Okay, here we are. So just the first overview of the work uh, is done with Dr. Ingo Fiedler and Dr. Elias Strehle, who are colleagues of mine at the Blockchain Research Lab. And uh, to give you a brief overview, um, I don't know if everyone knows what stable coins are, but essentially they are digital substitutes for fiat currency. So uh, one can think of a digital US dollar and they are an important aspect of cryptocurrency markets, especially because cryptocurrency exchanges 
uh, got problems with their banking connections in I think 2015 or 17 and uh, they weren't able to withdraw money anymore so they relied on this digital substitute and uh, this has become bigger and bigger and now we see stuff like uh, Facebook initiating Libra or China initiating a central bank digital currency. And I think it's a topic that will become more relevant in the future. And that's why we also wanted to look at it. And um, what's rather interesting about, well, blockchains in general and stable coins is that anyone is able to observe transfers in close to real time by a block explorers or by setting up a full node or by simply looking at the blockchain. And uh, we asked ourselves, how does transparency of monetary flows influence secondary markets and do feedback effects is, exist? And um, essentially what we did was um, we looked at blockchain data and had a look at how many known market participants we were able to identify that receive and send stable coins and overall there were three different categories and the one was unknown where we simply weren't identify what these blockchain addresses uh, who they who owned these blockchain addresses then there were cryptocurrency exchanges where people send or these stable coins to or withdraw them enabled to trade or enabled to cash out. And the last one are stablecoin treasuries that you can see as kind of an operator, kind of like a bank or a central bank that issues and destroys these stablecoins. And uh, we only looked at transfers of $1 million or more because, well, that's an arbitrary uh, value that we set. And we found different entities, 19, uh, that account for 71% uh, of senders and 60% of receivers. And uh, so this is pretty much uh, what we started with. And one idea is that the likeliest motive uh, of sending stable coins to a cryptocurrency exchange is that these stable coins will be used to buy Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. And when someone withdraws cryptocurrency uh, stable coins from a cryptocurrency exchange, most likely bitcoins or any other cryptocurrencies have been sold in advance. So uh, what we hypothesize is that there will be an increase in bitcoin trading volume around large stablecoin transfers. Um, we focus on bitcoin because, well, cryptocurrency markets are so highly correlated that uh, it's and Bitcoin has such a high market share that it's likely enough to look at Bitcoin. And we also did some uh, robustness tests for other cryptocurrencies, but yeah, Bitcoin worked out pretty well. <laughs> and okay. So as I just said, we were able to identify three different types of receivers and, address and senders. And if you map them on a matrix, have pretty much nine different possible uh, sender and receiver combinations for stablecoin transfers. And then we assigned uh, the associated level of information asymmetry to them. So transfers between two unknown addresses have the highest level of information asymmetry because no one knows what this transfer is about. While if I send from an unknown address to a cryptocurrency exchange, um, at least one part of the transfer is known. So uh, the level of information asymmetry is a little lower. And if, well, money is sent from one cryptocurrency exchange to another cryptocurrency exchange, anyone is able to simply see where this money is coming from and where it is going to. So uh, the level of information asymmetry is lowest. So, uh, yeah, we colored that and uh, yeah, it's pretty much, it depends on how many unknown market participants are uh, involved in a transfer. So uh, one hypothesis that we also uh, set was that when 
uh, traders or liquidity traders or market makers have timing discretion. They will postpone their trading to reduce risk of trade with informed counterparties. So when I see that someone is transferring $100 million to a cryptocurrency exchange, I don't really know what this is about, but the person that transfers this uh, currency knows what it's going to be used for. Is it going to be used to uh, buy cryptocurrency? Is it going to be used to short cryptocurrencies? So uh, in theory, as a market maker, I want to reduce my trading at that time in order to reduce that risk. So this second hypothesis says that uh, we expect the degree of information asymmetry that is tied to such transfers as I previously explained uh, to negatively relate to Bitcoin trading volume after information becomes public. So after a transaction is verified and broadcasted on the blockchain. And uh, the next two hypotheses are that, as I previously already said, that exchange deposits most likely relate to exposed purchases and withdrawals to ex ante sales. So uh, we expect that uh, there will be positive returns after stable coins are transferred to exchanges and negative returns uh, before stable coins are withdrawn from exchanges. And last slide on hypotheses. Sorry about that. Uh, we also say that transfer from a treasury, so um, an operator of stable coins. Uh, most likely refers to new stable coins entering the active market. And that means that the liquidity in the cryptocurrency market is growing. And either uh, this will lead to exposed purchases or the market perceives it as a signal of increased market liquidity. So we expect to see positive abnormal returns after the transaction. And uh, similarly, a transfer to a treasury will most likely lead to a burning of these coins. So burning means that I take my $100 million in digital stable coins, send them to this operator, and the operator destroys these coins and then wires me the fiat equivalent on my bank account. So that would mean that liquidity is actually drawn from the cryptocurrency markets and we would uh, expect that there are negative abnormal returns about, around these transfers. And the last hypothesis is that uh, we expect that the higher these transfers, the more value is transferred, the higher are also these uh, effects on returns and trading volume. So what data are we using to test all these hypotheses? So we are looking at one year of stablecoin data between April and March, April 19 and March 2020. Um, we look at six different stablecoins that all peg their value to a US dollar. And these are USDT, so Tether, USD coin, Pax, Binance, USD, Huobi, USD, and Gemini, USD. And data is mostly from the Ethereum blockchain and from Tether that is the only stablecoin that operates also on other blockchains. We also use Tron and Omni. Uh, we collected the timestamp, the transaction size, the transaction value in US dollar and uh, blockchain addresses. Well, we needed blockchain addresses to see if we can identify who is behind that address. And as I already said, we choose an arbitrary cutoff value of $1 million uh, that yeah, is arbitrary because we only, well, a uh, stablecoin transfer of $10 will likely not be relevant for the Bitcoin price. And that leads us to a sample of 1,587 stablecoin transfers that are uh, worth each more than $1 million. Uh, additionally, we collect uh, BTC USD price and volume data from Bitstamp. And for robustness checks, we also uh, use data for different currencies from Bitstamp and other BTC USD pairs from other exchanges. Um, what are the methods we use? We use event study methodologies. So 
as dependent variables, we use log returns and log trading volumes. And uh, we will use event windows of uh, minus 12 to plus 12 hours around the transfers and estimation windows of uh, minus 150 hours to minus 15 hours before it transfers. We use two different uh, significance test, one parametric and one non-parametric. And as is often the case with event studies, we only deem results valid that are significant for both of these statistics. And uh, for subsequent analysis, we also build uh, dummy variables for each of these nine uh, categories of sender receiver combinations and also transfer size, Bitcoin price in dollars to look at market sentiment and control variables for these six different stable coins and day of week effects. Um, now we come to the results. So uh, the very first result is that Tether USDT makes up 80.1% of the samples transactions. So uh, as can also be seen at the market capitalization of, across all stable coins, there's one stable coin that is highly dominant. And on average, these transactions have a value of 11 million or rather $12 million. And it's rather skewed because the uh, deviation is 25.1 million. So uh, we have some very large outliers and uh, the largest shares of these transactions are actually unknown transfers to exchanges. So UNEX means unknown to X change and TRUN means treasury to unknown. So that's a little tricky and we may <laughs> change that in the future because it led to confusion, but let's see. Um, when we simply look at observation windows versus estimation windows, uh, the results indicate that stablecoin transfers of $1 million or more are a highly relevant metric because we see higher average hourly returns and higher average trading volumes in the observation windows compared to the estimation windows. Um, okay, so that's it for the descriptives. And here are some event study results for the full sample. So um, first of all, we find a very strong positive effect on trading volume for all time windows and hours before and after the transaction. That's just an excerpt from the table in the paper. So you can have a look at it in the paper if you wanna see more. And uh, results for returns are ambiguous. So they are not that clear, which makes sense because, uh, well, there is selling and buying and this will lead to positive and negative returns while both of these uh, effects will increase trading volume. So this makes sense at first sight. But we can accept hypothesis on because, well, uh, we have a T and Z uh, statistics of 17 and 15, which is uh, rather significant, I would say. So uh, then we look at effects uh, for each of these nine different clusters. So here are uh, on the left side are uh, abnormal Bitcoin trading volume in the 12 hours before the actual transfer of stable coins. And on the right side is the abnormal Bitcoin trading volume in from the hour of the transfer until 12 hours later. And we see that uh, pretty much all different uh, transfer combination lead to a highly uh, significant abnormal returns apart from the one in the middle, which only has two observations, which likely explains why this is not a significant result. And uh, here's the next slide that does the same for returns. So on the left are abnormal returns from negative 12 to negative one. And on the right side, again, from zero to 12 hours. And here you see clear differences. So the, the red line are the returns and the gray lines are 95% confidence intervals. And the dashed uh, black line is always at zero. So you can pretty much see that 
some uh, transfers lead to clearly significant positive uh, abnormal returns before the transfers while others are negative, uh, which is quite interesting and pretty much confirms that uh, these address combinations matter. Um, so the last uh, thing we did was we actually predicted abnormal effects based on regression models uh, because, well, one thing that could be is that all these effects can simply be explained that by size, because, well, uh, it may be that transfers from an unknown address to an exchange are on average $1 million and uh, transfers from a stable treasury to uh, an exchange are on average $100 million. Uh, so we uh, also look uh, tested uh, what uh, we controlled for the price BTC, uh, for the Bitcoin price at the time of the transfer and controlled for stable coins and controlled for day of week effects and uh, actually identified that uh, exposed trading volume does not relate to implied information asymmetry. So uh, the idea was uh, that yes, we can observe highly significant uh, trading volumes across all samples, but the ones with the highest information asymmetry should have the lowest effect. And that was actually not the case. So we had to, uh, we cannot accept hypothesis two. The same goes for hypotheses three, four, and five. So uh, we only had one positive effect uh, between treasury to exchange and multiple negatives from treasury to treasury and from exchange to exchange uh, ex, ex ante. So we didn't find generalizable results for transfers of exchanges. So both hypotheses three and four are not accepted. Uh, similarly, we only found one positive effect for an, a transfer from a treasury to, to an unknown wallet. So that's also not accepted, but the last two ones were accepted. So all significant effects of transfers to treasuries. So the issuers of stable coins, or in that case, the ones that decrease the liquidity in the market uh, before events are negative and size is a highly significant positive determinant of abnormal effects in all models. Um, yes, so to conclude, um, we find that large stablecoin transfers affect Bitcoin prices and trading volume. Um, well, effects on trading volume are pretty much omnipresent. Price effects differ depending on sender and receiver and sometimes are not significant or not really clear. Um, it's an open question whether such market reactions relate to monitoring of blockchains or rather monetary flow monitoring via stable coins, or if they are caused by observed market movements like price or volume reactions. Um, transparency and real-time traceability of cash flows are a unique phenomenon of cryptocurrency markets. So that's nothing that any comparable financial market, if you can call it comparable, uh, has, can actually provide insights into historical and future market events. So uh, one question that uh, we formulate is, could transparent real-time on blockchain transaction data be beneficial for the efficiency of traditional markets? I would argue yes. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. And yeah. Thank you very much, Leonard, for the, present the presentation. Uh, you are perfectly on time. Uh, I remind uh, to the attendees that uh, uh, the, the questions about the paper will be uh, um, at the end of uh, all the presentation. Now, um, I briefly introduce uh, another uh, 
uh, work by Daniele, presented by Daniele Bianchi of uh, Queen Mary University. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, on the performance of cryptocurrency funds. Uh, this is a research work that follows the classic approach of uh, identifying whether fund managers create significant value for investors or not, but addresses the problems of a market that uh, is still young, heterogeneous, and with uh, uh, massive volatility. Uh, so there are uh, considerable challenges in doing inference uh, in uh, a market, a young market like uh, this one. Okay, uh, Daniele, uh, I leave uh, the word to you. Uh, Thanks, I, I think the previous speaker should, uh, is still sharing his screen. Okay, yes, I see your screen. No, it's not uh, mine, it's the previous No, screen. that's Nicolaos. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, can you see the slides? Moving? Yes, but Perfectly not moving at the moment. They're not moving. Uh, I see the first uh, the first page of the slides. Okay, then as usual. Okay, now we're moving. I see. Let me. Here it is. Oops. Okay, now it should be better, I guess. Is it? Can you see the slides moving? Okay, perfectly. Okay, thanks. So thanks a lot for having me and thanks to getting the paper into, into the conference. So um, it's a joint work with Mikola Babiak. Mikola, it's a colleague of mine, it's actually a friend of mine, is currently at the Department of Finance at Lancaster University Management School and I'm at Queen Mary. So uh, I'm gonna talk about, uh, cryptocurrency funds, meaning funds that specialize in, in, in uh, cryptocurrency markets, so investing in digital assets. Now, before getting deeper into the paper, let me just give you a little bit of why I think this is a relevant topic. Uh, what I'm highlighting here, it's an article that appeared on Bloomberg was June 2020. And basically the point of that article was highlighting uh, a survey that Fidelity was running a few months before and basically Fidelity was asking uh, large institutional investors, in fact, more than 800 institutions in the US and Europe, uh, their basically attitude towards Bitcoin. And surprisingly, uh, to some at least, um, about a third of uh, large institutional investors effectively was investing in cryptocurrency markets. 25% in Bitcoin, 11% on Ethereum, but roughly a third of big institutions were effectively owning uh, crypto assets. And uh, incidentally, Fidelity after a month was launching its first uh, Bitcoin fund for what they call wealth investors, so investors that can invest more than 100K um, you know, in a single chunk. And uh, um, uh, so this is basically you know, the, the, um, a signal, if you wish, that large institutional investors were actually actively coming into the marketplace. And this is reflected in the amount of asset under management. What I'm reporting here is the amount of um, asset uh, under management in million of US dollars from January, 2016 to a uh, couple of months ago, July, uh, July 2020, 2020. And as you can see, uh, there has been an exponential increase of the amount of asset under management that has been owned uh, by, um, uh, by um, uh, cryptocurrency, um, cryptocurrency funds, so crypto funds. And it's not just a matter of asset under management, but it's also a global phenomenon. If you look at the uh, geographical distribution of crypto funds, it's basically spread out all over the place. Uh, you have roughly a half of funds that are uh, um, based in the US and uh, the remaining say uh, a third in between Europe and the UK and a fraction of of the remaining ones between Asia, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Australia, and some of the uh, fiscal paradise like the Cayman Islands. 
So it's a global phenomena uh, and it's exponentially increasing uh, and you know, it's taking traction not only uh, among niche investors, but also among uh, large institutional investors. So what we do here, we try to dig deeper and see if there is any value in um, uh, active management in the cryptocurrency uh, market space. And in particular, we look at empirically the performance of roughly uh, uh, a bit more than 180 funds that effectively specialize in cryptocurrency investments. And we cover a period that is a bit more than five years uh, from March, 2015 to July, 2020. And when I say we look at the performance, basically we look at the benchmark adjusted net of fees returns. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be more specific about the data uh, in, in few slides. Um, then we have also contrib a contribution that is more methodological and for reasons that will be clearer in, in few minutes. So we provide a, a novel panel bootstrap approach that allows to disentangle you know, skills versus luck, if you wish. And that's particularly relevant because in the cryptocurrency market space, you have outlying funds, meaning funds that have massive, massive performances, both negative and positive. And in providing this methodology, basically we build upon uh, existing research papers by Kozowski and co-authors. It's Journal of Finance 26 and Femme French in their Journal of Finance 2020. Um, right, so what do we find? We, we basically find that the performance of best fund managers cannot be simply explained by sampling variation or luck, if you wish, and or, or by benchmark exposures. Now, the other thing that we find though, is that once you take into account fully that what so-called within strategy correlation, so the fact that the returns on different funds are correlated within a given strategy buckets, that um, results basically becomes statistically weak. So we have so, so, some mixed results in that respect. Um, now that was basically the paper. Uh, we're not obviously the first one in, in discussing the value of active asset management. There's been a growing in, there's been a growing literature out there that started basically since 1968 uh, with Jensen, and you have basically a chunk of the literature that basically says that active management creates little value for investors once you subtract fees. That's the case, for instance, of Werner's 2000 or Fame French 2010 in the Journal of Finance. Uh, there is another chunk of literature that instead says basically the opposite. So uh, active investment management, in fact, can generate significant and persistent value for, uh, for investors, right? And that's the case, for instance, of Bergen van Biesbergen in 2015 or Kaspersky and co in, in the 2014. Now, it goes without saying that most of this research uh, has been developed uh, within the context of equity market. And uh, if anything, uh, there hasn't been any systematic study or if you wish, uh, statistically speaking, comprehensive study on funds that specialize in, in digital assets, if anything, because there were not such a funds until a few years ago. So what we claim, what we claim um, to be here is basically the first paper that we have. So um, I, I guess with this audience, there is not really need, the, there is not really need of convincing that cryptocurrency markets are particular, but I want to highlight anyway, a few key features that I think are relevant um, in trying to understand the value of active asset and the management, um, uh, value of active uh, asset management within the context of cryptocurrency markets. So first and perhaps more importantly, cryptocurrency markets are sort of decoupled from traditional, more centralized, if you wish, uh, asset classes. So they are in fact segmented in a way, and that has been highlighted recently in you and, and uh, Tzidinski 2020, uh, just for coming in the review of financial studies. So there is this underlying idea that cryptocurrency provide um, uh, diversification benefits, if you wish. Then the second, uh, the second main reason why, uh, the second key feature, if you wish, uh, that relates to cryptocurrency markets is that, uh, you know, they are new, obviously, and mostly unregulated asset class. And regulation, in fact, plays a crucial role when it comes to uh, active asset management. And that has been highlighted by Novi Marx and, and Roy in 2011, Orlando and co in 2017. Basically the, the underlying idea is that the more relaxed is uh, the regulatory approach, the high risk taking behavior you're going to, you're going to have in, in, in uh, active management basically. And then the third, uh, the third one, the, the third key feature, if you wish, of cryptocurrency market is that it's a relatively low competition framework, meaning that um, there are effectively still at the minute, no cheap uh, passive investments in vehicles, at least uh, regularly available on 
on exchanges and uh, um, the amount of funds that has been uh, that, are, that, are, that are out there is still relatively low. So it's a relatively low competition uh, environment, which again, ultimately could be reflected in, in, in the way uh, managers uh, do the investment. <coughs> and, and last but not least, um, when it comes to looking at the data in crypto funds, you find lots of outline performances and within strategy correlation, non-normality, heteroscedasticity, all of, all of those things should be carefully be taken care of when you design your econometric, your econometric framework and they're particularly relevant in, in cryptocurrency markets. So um, for all those reasons, we think that you know, cryptocurrency markets create some sort of peculiar environment in which to understand at least Try to try to try to understand uh, asset management, the value of active asset management in a in a non common common framework. So, um, what about the data? So, uh, we collected monthly net of fee returns for roughly more than 180 funds. The base currency is US dollars, and as I said before, the sample goes from March 2015 to August 2020. Managers report uh, returns on a voluntary basis because there is no legal obligation. We include dead funds, so there is no survivorship bias, and we consider only uh, the initially reported returns. Uh, some, of the some of those funds actually report returns, revise their returns after a few months, but we report only the initially, the initially reported returns. So we try to take the point of view um, a bit more um, real time, if you wish. So we exclude funds with less than 5 million asset under management and with less than 12 months returns, which leaves us with uh, just with more than 160 funds. Now, 5 million asset under management is effectively, looks like a relatively small amount compared to, uh, uh, you know, standard equity funds. But the reality is that the median uh, size of a crypto fund is just a bit more than 20 million US dollars. So those are small funds. So five million, it's uh, uh, what we believe it's a regularly, it's a relatively uh, sensible cutoff. Uh, then, um, you know, as I said before, we're going to look at the net of fee performances, benchmark adjusted, uh, and we look at a variety of passive benchmark strategies instead of risk factors. And we follow basically the idea of Berk and Van Biesbergen in 2015. In terms of uh, benchmark, we look at a buy and hold investment in, in either Bitcoin or Ethereum plus an equal weight portfolio uh, that uh, comprehends the top 30 uh, cryptocurrencies that are sorted by sites plus uh, value weighted portfolios of those cryptos that are listed on, on Coinbase at each, at each month. So the data come from Crypto Compare, crypto compare which is a, a relatively uh, used uh, data provider in, in, for this type of research and in particular in the industry as well. And we take the volume weighted average of uh, prices and, and, and volumes from uh, uh, a bit more than 215 exchanges. And we apply a variety of filters to filter out suspicious trading activity. I've used this paper in a, in a, I used this data in a previous paper of mine uh, with a, with a um, Alex Dickerson, a co-author of mine, and I leave you, I leave you uh, to, to that paper for, for more details. Um, right, so uh, let me just give you a little bit of a snapshot of uh, the data. What I'm reporting here on the left panel, it's the uh, number of funds available in our sample, that's the orange line, uh, and against the uh, compounded return on Bitcoin, um, starting from one US dollars in, in March, 2015. Now, the, the only thing that I want to highlight here is obviously the composition of the, uh, the panel, the cross section that is not constant over time. It's a really unbalanced panel. Uh, most of the funds actually uh, remain alive, but there is a considerable fraction that, you know, do not survive uh, for longer periods. And that explains, you know, the drop in uh, the number of funds after uh, basically late 2019. And the other thing that I want to highlight is that there is some sort of correlation between the number of funds that there is out there and uh, Bitcoin prices. And this is basically clear in particular until the um, uh, price run up at the end of 2017, um, where you see that there is you know, basically common upward trends. Um, now the funds that we have in the sample can be classified in six different strategies. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, long-term funds, long-short, market neutral, multi-strategy, opportunistic, 
and a residual category that we call other. Um, and the, uh, the, the, way, the way those categories, the way those strategies are constructed is very similar to equity markets. For instance, a long short is typical. Um, it's, it's basically very similar to an equity, an equity long short fund. Uh, opportunistic is basically event driven and, and so on and so forth. So the way this strategy works is very similar to, to equity markets. Now, when it comes to the interesting bit here is uh, looking at the cross-section, obviously, of, of, of uh, performance metrics or descriptive statistics, if you wish. What I'm reporting here is on the left panel is the average returns in percentage monthly. And as you can see, there is a variety, there is a relatively significant dispersion of uh, average returns. And you have anything that goes from plus 30% on average to minus 30% on average, which is a pretty, pretty big dispersion. And the same for volatility, if you look at the right panel, <coughs> sorry, if you look at the right panel, you see that uh, there is a huge dispersion also in the risks, um, uh, or at least crude measure of risks such as volatility in the, in the cross section. So you have funds that have relatively lower volatility roughly around, the, around 20% on a monthly basis, but you also have funds that have uh, massive volatility, 60%, 80%, uh, even more than 100%. Uh, per month. That ultimately reflecting the sharp ratio. And uh, as you can see, um, there is a, a huge dispersion in the sharp ratios as well. And you have anything that goes um, from you know, above four, to, uh, four on an annualized basis and below zero on an annualized basis. And it's particularly relevant looking at negative sharp ratios because there is this conventional wisdom in investing in this type of funds is that you're gonna get positive performance always, but that's not effectively the case. Now, the last thing that I want to highlight looking at the cross-section of fund returns is the skewness. So um, what you see here is the cross-section of, uh, of um, you know, sample skewness for uh, each of the funds. And as you can see, the vast majority of funds have a, has a positive skewness. Although there is some non-negligible fraction of funds that have, that have a negative skewness, meaning that the probability of having large losses is much higher than the probability of having large gains, which again uh, goes um, against the conventional wisdom that uh, you know, investing these funds is, is easy money. So um, that was just to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, you know, the amount of heterogeneity that there is in the data here. Um, you have huge dispersion in terms of average performances, volatility, sharp ratios, obviously, but also you know, um, uh, skewness and, 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 and others. So what we do as a first step, we run a set of uh, aggregate regressions, meaning that we pool uh, funds either at the aggregate level, basically taking an equal weighted average of all of the funds in our sample and run a simple time series regression where the dependent variable that I call YT here is the equal weighted, um, uh, uh, say, portfolio funds. And the independent variable is the benchmark strategies. And we are ultimately interested in, in to look at the alphas, so to look at the residuals returns, if you wish. Or we cluster funds uh, at the strategy level. So we basically take each fund in a given strategy bucket and we take an equal weighted average and we run the exactly the same uh, regression. Oops. So here's the first set of results. So um, if you just focus on the aggregate ones uh, for a second, the aggregate, as I said, the dependent variable is an equal weight um, portfolio of all of the funds. So it's basically the, the arithmetic average. And the uh, independent variable is the benchmark is the benchmark strategies. As you can see here, the alpha it's uh, relatively high um, and significant, um, and is basically two and a, two two eight uh, percent on an annualized uh, on an annualized basis. If you look at the uh, results at the investment strategy level, so once we cluster funds based on on uh, different strategies, you have two things that actually come up. Uh, which we believe are interesting. The first one is that not all the funds, not all of the strategies, sorry, give you uh, positive, uh, sorry, significant alphas. For instance, if you see a long-term uh, multi-strategy and opportunistics that gives you alphas, which are not different from, from zero from a statistical perspective. And the other thing that I want to highlight is that even within those that gives you significant alphas, uh, there is relatively significant dispersion it goes from 1.5 for the market neutral strategy 
to 4.7 for the fund of funds. Now, if you look at the spread, so if you look at the differences between those alphas and the aggregate one, so what I'm reporting here is the difference between the alphas on the fund of funds, for instance, and the aggregate ones. And uh, I try to see if there is any statistical significance in the differences. The, the, uh, the heterogeneity across strategies becomes even more evident because you see that, for instance, fund of funds, they have higher alpha that is statistically significant, but for instance, long short do not, although they have in absolute terms a positive and significant alphas, but that's not different than the aggregate one and so on and so forth. If you look at the market neutral, they have a negative, much, neg much lower and statistically significantly lower, in fact, uh, alpha with respect to the aggregate uh, average and same thing for the um, opportunistic. So all in all, um, the takeaway here is that there is some evidence that fund manager cover the costs and generate value, at least on average, when you average out funds either at the aggregate level or you know, drilling down a different uh, strategy, strategy buckets. But there is also true that there are differences across investment strategies. And that you know, suggests that there might be some sort of within strategy correlations that you want to ultimately take care of. So we dig deeper and we look at the individual fund performances. Uh, and the issue when you look at the individual fund performances is that you know, the data becomes uh, a little bit more messy. Now, the, on, on the positive side, you want to look at individual performances because looking at the average fund returns could be misleading in a way. And that was the point of Kozowski and Coulter and, and Pam and French in, in 2010. And the idea is that if you aggregate funds, you cannot really control for the difference in individual managers' skills or risk-taking behaviors. So you want to, uh, you want to you know, look, at the, look at the disaggregated data more carefully. Now, when you look at the disaggregated more carefully, uh, though, you, you, you have uh, that ultimately the cross-section of alphas represent a complex mixture of normal distributions. So um, you have to, uh, you can no longer resort to, or at least reliably resort to uh, standard panel, panel regression. So what we do here, we extend existing literature and propose a panel bootstrap approach. I'm not gonna give you the details here. Everything is in the paper. We have an extended uh, appendix, but I just want to give you, you know, the main ingredients. So um, our panel bootstrap approach allows to uh, disentangle skills versus luck in managers track behaviors. And the underlying idea is that you want to simulate zero alpha returns and estimate the alpha, which is purely due to sampling variation and compare that alpha with the actual ones. And uh, oops, uh, by doing that, uh, we also uh, control for the fact that the exposure to benchmark returns could be strategy specific. For instance, market neutral is not exposed to the aggregate market trend in the same way that long short strategies are because they invest in, in different way. And ultimately, we want to take in care of obviously of the normality of fund returns and the fact that uh, returns might be correlated within a given strategy bucket. Okay, so uh, here is the results. What I'm reporting here is the cross-section of uh, distribution of the actual alphas. So the alphas that are estimated from the data, that's the blue distribution. Uh, and I'm basically uh, comparing that with the bootstrap distribution. So, which is the orange one. This distribution is basically the alphas that you're gonna get, uh, which are purely due to sampling variation. So without effectively any, uh, any true alpha involved. And the underlying idea of this exercise is that if you compare the two distribution and one, uh, the distribution of the actual ones is more shifted to the right with respect to the bootstrap ones, that's evidence that there is some skill uh, involved, right? So what you see here is that in fact, the probability mass of the actual alphas is likely more on the right hand side versus the bootstrap one, which gives you some sort of suggestion that, okay, there might be some sort of skilled involved, meaning that the uh, alphas that, are, that, are, that you see in the data are not purely due uh, to sampling variation. Now, this is the alpha. You could also look at the test statistics, obviously, which is just another way to look at the alphas because those are effectively uh, standardized alphas. And this is what we do. So what we report here is the same exercise, but instead of bootstrapping the alphas, we bootstrap the t-statistics. And again, you have the orange distribution, which is the bootstrap one, and the blue one, which is the actual t-statistics. And the, the idea is the same, obviously. You, you, you want to see if there is any disconnection between the two distribution. And again, the distribution on the actual one is likely more on the right. And for some of the um, t-statistics, in fact, it's above the usual threshold of two. 
but the thing becomes a bit more tricky once you start to cluster the standard errors for your statistics at the strategy level, which means you uh, explicitly take care of the fact that returns are correlated within, within a given strategy bucket. So that's the right panel. So you see that there is still this disconnection between the bootstrap and the actual uh, alpha, meaning that there is some evidence that sampling variation does not give you the full picture, but it's also true that these statistics, in fact, are, um, you know, are, are um, not higher than the usual uh, thresholds. So, um, uh, you know, we do, we do a variety of exercises. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to highlight one in particular, which is we split the sample in the pre and post ICO bubble period. So we basically look at the uh, funds uh, before December 2017 and after, basically taking as a cutoff, as a threshold, the burst of the uh, so-called ICO, ICO bubble. And we run a similar exercise. So what I'm reporting here is the, uh, using the funds uh, until December 2017. And again, there is evidence of skill versus lack, meaning that the distribution of the actual alphas is slightly more tilt, tilted towards the right, um, you know, for, for some fund at least. But again, once you cluster uh, standard errors as a strategy level, only, you know, basically two funds here give you a uh, statistical significant performance and things are slightly in line uh, when you look at the sample from January 2018, 2018 on. So after the, the burst of the ICO bubble, there is like the disconnection on the, on the right axis, meaning especially in the right day, meaning that there is some fund that has a performance which cannot be reconciled by, by sampling variation, but the evidence becomes relatively weak once you start to cluster funds at the strategy level. Um, then we have a variety of robustness check in the paper. We extend, we relax some of the assumption in our bootstrap approach. For instance, we use a block bootstrap, uh, independent resampling. We, um, look at the, um, uh, we replace the benchmark strategy with usual risk factor portfolios, such as, you know, the aggregate value weighted market, momentum, liquidity, and volatility risk. But the main results goes through in the sense that, you know, the main idea, uh, the main message of the paper um, does, not, does not change independently on, on the specific issues. So to conclude, uh, we use a, a novel uh, panel boost up approach, uh, which allows us to investigate the net of key performances of funds that specialize in digital assets. The results um, that we show basically tells you that there is a small fraction of manager that seems to generate an economically large performance, which cannot be simply reconciled by sampling variation or uh, by luck, if you wish. However, um, uh, such performance becomes uh, weakly statistically significant. In fact, perhaps not even statistically significant once you start to taking care of uh, returns correlation within strategy buckets. Um, and the results goes through basically pre and post uh, the ICO bubble period. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Daniele, for the presentation and the interesting results about this uh, new market of uh, crypto funds. Uh, we, leave, we leave, obviously, uh, the questions at the end and um, now we we pass to uh, another interesting uh, research work by uh, Nikolaus Kiriatsis of the University of uh, Thessaly um, the title of the paper is uh, Erden Behavior in Digital Currency Markets an Integrated Survey and Empirical Estimation uh, a paper in which uh, the author proposes a review of the relevant uh, contribution on the uh, Erden behavior across asset class and a more specific test related to the crypto asset uh, uh, with different subsample. Um, I leave the word to Nicolaos to uh, its presentation. Please, Nicola. Good afternoon. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicola Oskiriazis from the Department of Economics, University of Thessaly. 
Uh, this paper is about herding behavior in digital currency markets with I have conducted an integrated survey as well as an empirical estimation. I have to uh, emphasize that uh, I have investigated herding behavior uh, not only in about cryptocurrencies but also about transitional assets. More or less, the sections uh, in this uh, survey and the American estimations contain the introduction, uh, hidden phenomena in a number of traditional financial assets, such as uh, stock markets, bond markets, and funds, by employing micro data, hidden phenomena in commodity markets, in derivative markets, in real estate markets, as well as in large and advanced versus weak or developing markets. Thereby, we could have a comparison between traditional financial markets and modern forms of liquidity, that is, cryptocurrency. Moreover, uh, data and methodology have been employed uh, concerning 240 digital currencies uh, in order to see whether uh, there is certain behavior during, during bull periods and bear periods. Thereby, there is a comparison between upward tendencies in cryptocurrency markets and downwards tendencies in cryptocurrency markets. Uh, moreover, we discussed the empirical findings and economic implications uh, as concerns uh, both the survey, the literature review, uh, as well as uh, the empirical estimations. And discussions and conclusions and avenues for further research uh, are also mentioned, provided. Uh, we have some introductory uh, facts uh, that I'm not going to analyze. Price fluctuations of Bitcoin and Ethereum, that is because they are the two major cryptocurrencies. Uh, we talk about uh, Bitcoin being a hybrid of commodity money and fiat money. And uh, that it employs peer-to-peer -peer networks and open source software in order to prevent double spending and bypass the need for intermediation by commercial banks. But Bitcoin has a fixed supply cap. Some things about Ethereum, that is a smart uh, contract platform that started trading in, in August 2015. We talk about Ripple, that is used to settle payments in other currencies in financial instruments over the network, and transactions can be carried out in any fiat currency, digital currency, or financial assets but the transaction fee must be paid with Ripple, as well as we say a few things about Litecoin, but its issuance started in October 2011, and its earliest price was very, very low. And it has been born out of some modifications to the Bitcoin software. We talk about Tether, but there was a colleague that said a lot of things about Tether Bitcoin before. The main characteristics of the cryptocurrencies is, but, is that uh, they were introduced uh, by Nakamoto in 2008 and has heard coin offerings of a wide spectrum of digital currency. They constitute alternative forms of liquidity with remarkable differences in ownership, transactions, and production matters in relation to the traditional monetary assets. There is a heated debate about uh, whether uh, cryptocurrencies uh, can fulfill the functions of money. And their special characteristic is their decentralized nature and the, the lack of regulatory authority. I'm not, uh, they, are, they are considered to be extremely profitable, but also extremely risky. And to constitute the good the diversifiers or hedgers uh, against other cryptocurrencies or against the more traditional financial assets. The hegemonic uh, role of Bitcoin uh, sometimes has been lower, but uh, it remains to be the most important cryptocurrency. The targets of this uh, survey and empirical investigation, first of all, is to understand the rational and irrational behavior uh, that is enhanced, enhanced and uh, to provide an overall perspective on herding phenomena in financial markets. Moreover, uh, is to provide a comparative analysis of herding behavior across markets and to conduct an empirical estimation of herding and uh, make a comparison between herding intensity during bull markets versus bear markets. The aim of this uh, study is to enable the interested reader to have a compass with, in, when investing in digital forms of money and investments and to have a better acquaintance with the tendency of such uh, irrational markets to, of such markets to behave irrationally and to follow signals from other cryptocurrency markets, mainly from Bitcoin. 
Herding in, in economics and finance uh, constitutes uh, a very important term, a very important concept. This represents the irrational tendency that investors uh, show, exhibit, towards mimicking behavior of other investors, if, uh, even though they totally disagree with this way of thinking. It is closely related to irrational exuberance, that, as it has been analyzed by Robert Seeler, uh, the Nobel Prize, but has gained the Nobel Prize. And uh, this irrational exuberance leads to over enthusiasm and the creation of asset price bubbles uh, that were evident, uh, especially during, during 2017. Headline behavior can be expressed in various forms, such as trading in the same direction with others, following the trend in previous trades, imitating or correlating one's behavior to the other's behavior. Usually, investors that are not uh, very experienced experienced are prone to become risk lovers without being able to understand the risk that they suffer. Such behavior is often encouraged by lack of certainty regarding economic conditions and by extreme conditions, that is bull markets or bear markets, uh, such as during turmoil. Overall, we find that helping phenomena in stock markets uh, are, are more susceptible to uh, exhibit irrational behavior and lead to herding phenomena during turbulent periods, that is especially during bull markets. When it comes to bond markets and funds and micro data, that is, micro data means proprietary data on investors' accounts, portfolios, and transactions. It can be argued that herding is not more intense during bear markets in, compari in comparison with bull markets, but it is more powerful uh, as concerns to risk the liquid bonds. And uh, it is found that herding has destabilizing the symmetric impacts of herding. Uh, there are destabilizing the impacts of herding and prices. Moreover, open-ended funds are found to be receivers of higher impacts from herding behavior than closed-end funds. As regards commodity markets, herding is influential both in bull and bear markets, and also sentimental herding can be observed. Uh, it is also found that herding intensifies uh, the intensive for higher speculation and increases risk appetite. As concerns derivative markets, higher volatility is favorable for the appearance of herding phenomena. Uh, there is no evidence about uh, herding leading to destabilization, and it is found that large spillovers to other markets uh, are identified. Small traders are found to be most affected, more affected uh, than uh, more powerful traders, and uh, the effects uh, are found to be modest and intensified in periods of high uncertainty. As concerns real estate, uh, in VR markets, it's found to be more stressed. And when it comes to the comparison about herding phenomena in advanced and developing economies, more intense herding behavior is identified, is uh, found during extreme rather than normal times. It should be noted that, develop, that developing countries such as China present a large uh, set of similarities with the with the highly advanced uh, economies such as us japan as well as the euro area it should be noted that internationalization of markets is found to be important for getting behavior and spillovers to other markets we now come to the main part of our study hidden behavior in digital currency markets in the empirical investigation uh, as uh, an overall conclusion uh, based on uh, primary studies about cryptocurrency is that the majority of, stu of studies concerning herding phenomena in uh, the markets of cryptocurrencies employ the cross-sectional absolute deviation measure as well as the cross-sectional standard deviation methodology. These findings uh, between the two methodologies are not identical. The, the studies, uh, the empirical papers that have employed both of these measures provide mixed results about whether herding behavior is stronger during bull markets or downward uh, tendencies. Investors uh, show an inclination towards irrational behavior and mimicking others' decisions that is more emphasized during turbulent market periods. 
we have to emphasize that uh, this finding uh, abides by previous findings that concerns market hearing in markets of traditional uh, assets. The, nevertheless, outcomes are split uh, as regards uh, whether bull markets are more able to provide higher hearing incentives than their, than their markets. It has to be outlined, uh, it has to be underlined that, their, that uh, most empirical research indicates that their markets uh, are uh, more favorable for uh, the adoption, for the presence of certain phenomena. During normal economic conditions, no evidence of herding is found. We have, in order to conduct our empirical investigation, we have employed uh, 240 high capitalization, medium capitalization, or low capitalization cryptocurrency. And the, the standard that we have set uh, in order to select this cryptocurrency is that uh, they were all active during the BR period, that is, the, uh, of cryptocurrency, that is, since the first, from the 1st January of 2017 until the 18th uh, December of 2017. And we have also conducted separate estimations, estimations and as concerns the BR period that uh, covers the period from 19 December 2017 until 15 December of 2018. We have employed the cross-sectional absolute deviation methodology that has been adopted uh, by Chang et al. and Xiang et Zheng 2010. This is expressed like this. Uh, this is not uh, difficult to understand. That is uh, the returns of one cryptocurrency minus the returns of the market. Chang et al. have also used this model. This has been an extension of uh, this model. Uh, so there is a squared return uh, term, where R and T shows the absolute equally weighted market return, where, uh, whereas this uh, square displays the squared market return. The findings uh, from our empirical study have shown that uh, during the, the BR market, uh, this measure of herding has been uh, during the bull market, it has been more intense than the beer market. Uh, we concentrate uh, our attention uh, to these results concerning the terms of our equation, the, that is the alpha, the gamma one, and the gamma two terms. Uh, especially, we center our attention to the gamma two coefficient. We find that herding behavior exists in cryptocurrency markets during the bull period. Uh, this can be found because the gamma 2 term uh, displays an, uh, a negative sign and is a large coefficient. Thereby, the negative sign of uh, the coefficient of the standard and poor's pedagogia squared returns uh, indicates that there is that there is herding behavior during the bull market. We have to emphasize uh, that these uh, findings comes to contrast come to contrast with the findings of previous studies that uh, the majority of previous previous studies indicate that herding behavior is more intense during slightly more intense during the BR market. Nevertheless, uh, as to say some our findings, in the BR market there is no evidence of herding phenomenon. It should be noted though that uh, both the coefficients gamma n, uh, gamma one, and the gamma two concerning both the bull market and the bear market do not display statistical significance. Overall, it can be found uh, that uh, we have a negative sign during the bull period. Uh, the driving factor of the cryptocurrency market is the mean return of the major digital currency, and these outcomes, as we have said. Do not abide by the majority of literature that displays uh, that herding is more influential on financial markets during the beer era. As it concerns the overall economic implications, uh, we can find from our literature review but, that uh, both uh, the absolute standard and the square standard measures present mixed results about whether herding is more influential during upwards tendencies or downwards tendency. Uh, only the first methodology provides evidence that herding is stronger during BR markets. 
Bitcoin remains the most influential among the cryptocurrencies and thereby exerts curbing effects uh, in other cryptocurrencies. And uh, from uh, overall, all in all, uh, we can see that beer conditions are found to be slightly more favorable from, for the presence of curbing phenomena in the markets of digital currencies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicolaos, for the presentation. Uh, we are perfectly on time. Uh, now uh, we concentrate our attention on the last paper of this session. Um, the paper will be presented by Marco Lambrecht of uh, University of Heidelberg. Uh, the paper is titled Does Mining Fuel Bubbles? An, experiment, an experimental study on cryptocurrency markets. Um, the topic of the paper is uh, uh, centered on the uh, bubbles affecting crypto assets. Uh, the authors investigate if uh, the unique structure of the crypto assets uh, based on mining, proof of work and fixed supply development could be the primary driver of the bubbles. Um, to, uh, to verify this hypothesis, they built an interesting controlled laboratory uh, experiment that involved uh, two, more than 200 students. Okay, I leave the word to uh, Marco. Uh, please, Marco. Thank you very much, Gianfranco, and also to the organizers and the presenters at this uh, workshop. It feels really good to be here and to have the opportunity to present my research um, here at this workshop. And uh, I really want to dive right into it. So uh, you have already mentioned, um, together with my co-authors, Andis Sofianos and Yilong Chu from Heidelberg, we have been doing an experimental study on cryptocurrency markets. And uh, we try to tackle the question and focus on the question whether mining actually fuels bubbles at all. And let me start with our intentions and our motivation for this research. So why did we uh, think this might be an interesting project? Well, we are observing some pretty high price volatilities of cryptocurrencies in the, in the real markets, right? And um, this actually might contradict this intended use as a currency because, well, currency not per se need to be a store of value, but some stability would actually be very nice because like even transaction times of a couple of days might have uh, changes of the, of the um, value of these cryptocurrencies, which is probably not intended. Uh, effects that um, are like related to this overpricing and these bubbles could eventually spill over to other markets and have some consequences for the real economy. So we thought it might be interesting to isolate and analyze the, the influence of the mining mechanism that the cryptocurrencies and the, the most famous one, Bitcoin, actually built on. And you know also that the, this, this mining, the technical term for it is the proof of work mechanism, a consensus mechanism for transactions and also generation of these tokens. So why do we take this to the lab? Well, we could also try to look at the real world data, but the problem there is that um, the real world data contains a lot of confounds and also there's no counter counterfactuals that we could compare to. So we think it's a good idea to look at the effects of mining in isolation in a controlled lab setting. Now, given that there is a, a lot of experts here in the audience, I think many people are familiar with Bitcoin mining and I'm not telling you a lot of new things here, but I wanna highlight that Bitcoin mining these days, um, well, is a very centralized thing. So I have a picture here of a mining farm. I think it's somewhere in the US. You can see that uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, a lot of equipment, uh, so-called ASICs, being stacked in this, uh, in this picture, and they are all used to mine Bitcoins. Um, mining bit of Bitcoins comes at a cost because you can also see there are a lot of cables over here. So all of these ASICs need some electricity to run and electricity is costly. So 
mining does not come for free. And also what I want to highlight with this picture, in contrast to maybe the early uh, days of Bitcoin, um, it is not so simple for everybody to just start being a miner. So I actually do have a very old device. I don't know if you can see it in the picture here, but this is one of the very old devices, uh, let's say five years ago, which was used to mine Bitcoins. Back then people could uh, acquire these, these equipments and just uh, go ahead and mine. But this is probably uh, not possible today. So if I would be um, thinking of becoming a miner, I have uh, some entry barriers that I need, I need to face first and I cannot just decide to start mining tonight or something like that. So this is what we actually want to try to capture with our experiment. Our experimental design is a two by two treatment design, which uh, has two, um, um, two things that we actually change in our design. One of them is the way that assets are generated. And we call this asset influx here in the table. So assets in our experiment, on the one hand, just come as a gift to all of the participants. They just have them. On, on the other hand, um, then this is what we change and vary across our treatments. Our subjects do need to mine these assets and it is going to be a costly mine. On the other hand, we also vary whether all of our market participants have the same options and the same role in the market or whether there are some restrictions for some of the participants. So um, let's uh, focus on the mining half treatment here, which is the interesting one. Um, we only allow half of our subjects to actually be miners and the other half cannot mine at all. This is the way how we model these entry barriers that not everybody can just decide to be a miner on the spot. Um, then we actually do invite some students to our laboratories. We use the laboratories in Frankfurt and in Heidelberg for our um, sessions. Uh, in Frankfurt, it was at the Goethe University. In Heidelberg, it was the Ruprecht Karls University. And we also do have monetary incentives for our subjects for each of the tasks. So this does not mean that we actually created any type of crypto millionaires in our lab. This is definitely not what's happening. People get paid slightly above minimum wage, I would say. But at least there were also some people who actually earned about like 30 euros a bit more uh, for, let's say, a little bit more than one hour of their time. So um, we are quite confident that people do pay attention to the tasks and um, do concentrate on our experiments while they are in the lab. Um, the sessions were set up in the way that we have eight participants per market and we run nine markets per treatment. Um, we actually allow our subjects to trade using a continuous double auction mechanism. While this might sound very technical, I think it's one of the very popular um, implementations for trading. Um, some of the smaller Bitcoin trading platforms actually even still use the continuous double auction mechanisms today. So there is one in Germany, which is uh, just accessible under the do domain bitcoin.de. And if you look at it, this is basically exactly what we had in our experiment. It means that subjects at all point in time can place bids as well as asks on the, on the asset. And they can also see the list of bids and asks of other people and can choose uh, to accept any of those if they feel to do. Uh, in the lab, we actually do have periods for trading. So we, we actually made 15 periods out of it. Um, as we, oh, sorry, that was not good. Um, I should not touch the mouse wheel, <laughs> sorry. So we are uh, trying to um, use a simple asset to focus actually on the effects of mining here. And the simple asset in our context means that we do not pay any frequent dividends, which also would be a bit weird. Um, as you guys know, Bitcoin doesn't pay any dividends. Um, what we do have actually is a single redemption value at the end of the experiment. So after period 15, the subjects can, so to speak, return their assets to the experimenter and they will get a redemption value, which is uncertain. So it is a, a small lottery that they do play, but the, this whole lottery is basically simple to understand from the get-go. This is what we uh, were trying to focus on and not overcomplicate our asset design in this sense. And if you are in the mining treatment, then actually asset generation comes at a weekly increasing cost over time, um, which is, I think, what also resembles 
the cryptocurrency markets and Bitcoin. Look at these two graphs comparing our experimental design and the asset supply in the experiment to the real Bitcoin supply. Um, these graphs, I mean, I guess you, you all know about them. It's about the halving steps of the block rewards. So that means that over time, basically every four years, the rewards will decrease. And just by this exponential decrease of re the rewards, the uh, costs of generation increase over time. And we have a similar implementation in our experiment, actually. Um, I'm actually very happy that these graphs look quite similar. Then let us talk about some previous research and um, other researchers, what they have been doing in this context. Since I'm um, focusing on the experimental literature here, maybe there's not a lot that you have been seeing in the Bitcoin context before, but in experimental uh, finance, there is a long tradition of looking at, at these kind of markets. And one of the most famous contributors is probably Vernon Smith, a Nobel Prize winner. And he actually did an experiment in 2000, which was very similar to ours. And therefore, um, we actually think that we can expect a similar thing, namely that if the design is quite simple as we have it in our gift treatments, we would expect that people do trade around the fundamental value of the asset, which can be calculated from the lottery that you're actually playing at the end of the experiment, right? It's not a super hard task to calculate this fundamental value at all. And we don't expect a lot of overpricing or price volatility going on. Um, on the other hand, there have also been some bubbles in these flat fundamental values settings. But um, as I would say, these are a bit more complicated settings. They actually used frequent dividends in each period. It's a bit more technical of uh, how to understand why this is a flat fundamental value setting. But let's just mention there can also be some bubbles in these types of settings. Furthermore, there has, has been research which is actually focusing on, on Bitcoin um, um, specifically. And the author Saleh and Hinson and his co-authors actually found um, that, or conject basically, that some of the Bitcoin overpricing comes from the fact that Bitcoin has a pretty sluggish supply. As you all know, it is not possible to create just a lot of Bitcoins uh, right now because we need a lot. So if we actually need a lot right now, there is no other way than increasing the price by quite a bit. Um, now looking at our other treatment uh, variable that we are changing, all versus half treatments, there are a couple of papers that say that there might be some larger bubbles if you have some asymmetry in your markets. Um, specifically, Weber and Camera say that usually traders try to have somewhat a balanced portfolio, which means that, for example, if you start with only cash and you are not holding any assets, then you will really want to get a couple of assets just to have some more balance in your portfolio. Furthermore, I want to point out that um, experiments about um, experiments with students in, the, in this um, um, experimental finance field do have some external validity. Um, for example, the paper by Weitzel uh, and his co authors in 2020 shows that actually financial professionals behave very similar, and therefore also the results are very similar if you compare the experiments with students to experiments with financial professionals. It has also been a long time uh, contribution of Vernon Smith, who has been trying to um, make a point about this for many years as well. So we are also confident that there, there is something to learn from experiments with students. Now, let me sum up what are the research hypotheses that we come up with after scanning the literature. So our first hypothesis is that in our very simple treatment, gift all, uh, where everybody will just get the uh, asset and then they can start trading them with each other, there will probably not be a pattern of bubbles and crashes at all. Now, the first thing that we change is we only give half of our people assets. The other half gets a little bit of more cash to compensate. Uh, I don't want to go into the calibration right now. If you're interested in the details, definitely we can. But um, I think in the 20 minute talk, this is not perfect. But so in this gift half treatment where we have the asymmetry implemented, we think that the prices in the, in the asymmetric treatment might be slightly higher than in the 
um, symmetric treatment in gift all. Let's look at our mining treatments now. So we um, do actually anticipate that our mining treatments will um, show some patterns of bubbles and crashes. First of all, picking up on the point before, sluggish supply, right? Uh, this might uh, immediately contribute to this situation. There might also be something going on that people see these increasing trends of um, costs for generating the, the asset. And this might somewhat, um, yeah, um, also influence their pricing of the assets when trading. And uh, last but not least, there's a fourth hypothesis where we want to compare our mining treatments. So again, um, asymmetric treatments might be more prone to bubbles. So therefore we think that the prices in our mining half treatment actually exceed, exceeds the price in our mining all treatment. Let's look at the results that we do find when we um, implement this in the laboratory. So here we, we are looking at the median session of each treatment, and we are looking at the weighted average prices that people were trading. And in the, these dashed lines actually represent our gift treatments, while the solid lines represent the mining treatments. The blue ones are the symmetric all treatments, while the green ones are the asymmetric half. And um, looking at this price trajectory, it feels like our gift treatments are not really bubbling at all. Maybe there's some slight overpricing going on. As you can see here, I've also depicted the fundamental value as just a flat line to compare to. So, well, slightly overpriced, but just flat, right? There's not really a lot of crashes and bubbling going on. On the other hand, for our mining treatments, we actually do see a pattern of like a bubbling and crash. For mining all the bubble, comes pretty slow um, shortly before the end of the market and then basically crashes towards fundamental value in the last three periods. On the other hand, our mining half treatment, um, very surprising. It has a much steeper um, um, price trajectory at the beginning. The bubble even bursts very early in our experiment and then well, there is another 10 periods until it gets back to fundamental value ever so slightly. Let's focus a bit more on our, um, on our analysis. We, we just looked at the prices, but this definitely does not give any uh, statistical support, but we can look at some bubble measures which are pretty popular uh, in um, experimental finance literature. So um, right now we are looking at the um, relative absolute deviation from fundamental value, as well as the relative deviation, a crash variable and a spread variable. And we find that they are significantly different only when comparing the gift treatment to the respective mining treatment. There is nothing going on when we compare the gift treatments to each other. And also when we overall look at them, we do not find differences between our mining treatments. This is the overall analysis. Um, since the graph here looks like there is differences, but not maybe overall, but in the timing of the bubbles, we felt like it is interesting to split our markets in two halves and compare the first halves and the second halves separately. And if we do that, we actually find significant differences, statistically significant differences in the first half of the experiments, both in the um, absolute deviation as well as the de relative deviation. I did not report the crash variable here because it does not make sense if you split the market in two halves. In the second half, there is nothing going on. They are not, uh, statistically not different. Now let's try to find out why this is going to happen and, and uh, why this happened and what people might be thinking um, when they choose their actions. So first of all, I want to show you the graph of our mining treatments again, but now I add the costs for mining in those treatments. And as you see here, um, well, the mining costs are very similar in both, in both treatments. They just exceed a little bit in the mining half treatment. So people mine more in the mining half treatment, which might be due to the steep rise that we see in the early periods. But what I really want to focus on is that our mining all treatment 
really follows this trajectory of the mining costs with a small markup. Here, the markup disappears. And at some point here, this bubble bursts. But when we get across the fundamental value line, when we are crossing this line, it seems like we are basically following the mining cost trend. This does not seem to be the case for the mining half. This seems to decouple very quickly. And um, I would not argue that this is uh, the same situation there. Furthermore, we can also try to take a look at the order book. Like how do actually people trade in these markets? And um, I'm showing this graph. Uh, I don't think there is a lot to distinguish here between the lines, but I want to make the point here to say that all of our treatments and all of our markets, the prices are basically dictated by the sellers. So you see that 75% of the trades occur because somebody accepts the ask of another person, not somebody who really wants to sell and accepts a bid of another person, but people who really want to buy and accept the ask of another person. And this is not really different in any of our treatments here. So what I take away from this graph is that sellers are setting the price. Now let's look at what sellers and also um, the, the potential buyers in these markets are doing. So here we, have, we are looking at graphs of the, the bids on the left side and the asks on the right side of our treatments. And what you see here is that the bids of all of our treatments in the initial period is very, very similar. But then basically what happens is that in our gift treatments, the bids are, uh, sorry, the bids are here. So, sorry, this, this was very bad. So the asks here, the asks in our gift treatments do not increase over time, but they stay rather flat. On the other hand, looking at our mining treatments and the asks in the mining treatments, we have an increasing tendency here. Looking at, at, the, at the bits in all of our treatments, well, they follow the trends of the asks, which might not be too surprising. We already realized that basically sellers are dictating the prices. But so for me, the puzzling question here is, what is the, what is the reason why is it possible for the sellers in our mining treatments to get an increasing tendency while the sellers in our gift treatments do not have this increasing tendency but rather a flat tendency and if we are speculating this could be due to some kind of coordination device that people have now because they, they see some increasing mining costs they also might just anticipate that uh, there is a less and less influx or less and less supply for the market. Um, they might envision prices to go up in the future and therefore they are willing to um, have this increasing price trajectory. They might also be reluctant to sell below any um, cost that they have been paying when mining these assets and this might also explain the thing. It's not a clear answer from, from the evidence that we have here but these are maybe um, some, some, some food for thoughts of what might be going on. Last but not least for the analysis, I also have um, some analysis of our debriefing survey questions. They were not incentivized, but I nevertheless think it's interesting to just have a quick look at them. So do traders actually change the elevation, their evaluation of the asset um, when they get treated with our costly mining treatments? And we do find that the own value, which is what people would be willing to pay for the, for the asset, is very close to fundamental value and not significantly different across our treatments. So people still do understand what the value of this asset should be at the end of the experiment. But if you ask them, what do you think would be a market value? Like selling this maybe to other people, there is a significant difference. Not very surprising if you have just been participating in a market where prices were very different, right? But um, the interesting part is here that their own value is not affected by this treatment. We also wanted to take a look whether the perception of uh, values is different for miners or non-miners, but here it seems like there is nothing going on. It's not a, a huge uh, sample here, so though these values look different to those, and here we find significant differences, we do not find them here. Um, it might be underpowered, but given that the p-value is so way off, um, I would also feel confident to make the claim that there are no differences over here. 
So let me quickly conclude. The, um, it seems like that we found evidence that the generation of assets at increasing costs, which is a feature of the proof of work mechanism, actually contributes to price volatility and to bubbles and overpricing. Um, furthermore, we think that cryptocurrencies potentially might be um, well intended to be more stable um, and therefore it might be interesting to look for other mechanisms to ensure some price stability. And there might be the, the topics that we have been hearing about earlier, proof of stakes, stable coins. Um, in the paper, we are also discussing that there are definitely other mechanisms at play. We have just heard uh, the uh, herding um, idea and I, we also are confident that herding um, is, taking, uh, is playing a role in these cryptocurrency markets. But we also want to point out that this proof of work is basically, and the blockchain is basically the um, innovation that came with cryptocurrencies. Herding as a reason for bubbles can also happen in other markets. So this blockchain thing and this costly generation of assets seems to be the new feature to look at. And um, that's why we concentrated on it. And with that, I, I'm done with my um, time. I think I took a bit longer. I'm sorry, Gianfranco, but uh, please forgive me. No problem, uh, Marco. Really, thank you for the clear presentation. And uh, now, uh, before we start with Q&A, um, I would thank you. Let me thank you, uh, the sponsor of this conference, uh, Czech Sig, uh, The Rock Trading and uh, Deloitte Italy. Um, and uh, I remind you for the old, I remind to the authors and uh, for the attendees that there is uh, a special issue of uh, economic notes journal connected to this conference. Uh, and uh, if you want more details, uh, uh, you will find it in the conference uh, web pages. Okay. Uh, the remaining time is for questions. Uh, please, uh, if you, there are questions from the floor. Someone has some question. Okay, um, the first one, I have one question to, uh, to Lennart. Uh, in your paper, you consider a sample of 1,500 uh, more or less cases uh, of large uh, uh, flows uh, of stable coin. Uh, but uh, you say that uh, uh, in many cases, uh, these uh, uh, flows are overlapping in the estimation period of the Eden study. Um, I would ask if you consider to reduce the sample uh, to only the cases uh, not overlapping to have uh, uh, much more clear results that uh, uh, for some hypothesis, uh, seems to be mixed. Um, yes, thanks for this question. We uh, definitely spent a lot of time on that specific question uh, because in, well, in event studies, you usually do not want any overlapping effects and research has only just begun uh, developing methods on how to adjust results based on uh, overlapping events. So yeah, it's a work on progress and we will definitely think about it. But I have a feeling as if, uh, well, the one thing is the methodological correctness and the possibility to say 100% that uh, the, the abnormal return can be fully explained by the event. And on the other hand, there is this effect in the market and uh, you can argue that it's not really that relevant to 100% explain it through this event. So 
Yeah, it's a trade-off and uh, we're definitely spending more time on that. So yeah, thanks for this comment. Okay, thank you, Leonard. Uh, right at the end, please, if you have uh, some questions from the attendees. Uh, I not see anybody at the moment. Uh, another question to uh, Nicolaus. In your empirical uh, investigation, uh, I saw that you uh, used the, the like benchmark to calculate uh, the cross-section uh, absolute deviation. Uh, the standard and poor 500 uh, as a benchmark, but uh, it is a strange choice uh, considering this special market of uh, crypto assets. Why did you not consider the uh, a, a benchmark, a typical benchmark, a value-weighted benchmark of the uh, more uh, uh, liquid uh, crypto asset or, for example, uh, Bitcoin? Uh, Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I used this benchmark, the standards and pools, based on a previous study that had uh, employed the same benchmark. Of course, you are right. We could use a benchmark based on Bitcoin or more advanced benchmarks in further uh, exploration in the study. This would be a very nice extension in the study that you suggest. Okay, thank you, Nicolas. Um, we don't have any other question from the participants that, that are reducing in number. Maybe uh, they are uh, a little bit tired and uh, maybe preparing for the last panel session. So if uh, there are not uh, other questions, uh, we can uh, stop here this investment session. Uh, I really thank you uh, the authors of the papers for their contribution, the audience for their interest. Uh, and uh, I leave you with the hope that uh, we will meet directly in the very near future. Okay. See you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.